Hey everyone, it's Wednesday and another episode of Julie's PR Patter. I am so excited today uh, to have a colleague of mine um, with me. Uh, his name is Kevin Kane, and Kevin is currently communications business consultant at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield, based in upstate New York, where it's quite cold. I understand. It's um, going to be 65 today. Let's, oh, my God. You know. uh, anyway, there he provides <laughs> internal and external communication support to all areas of the organization, including content development for member newsletters, crisis communications, planning and message delivery, internal and external channel contribution, coordination, and he serves as a liaison with a number of operational areas. This is kind of the topic of what we're going to talk about today, collaboration. So he he coordinates and collaborates with information technology, customer care, business resilience, and compliance. As a senior strategist and subject matter expert, Kevin has been instrumental in building collaborative relationships with a cross-functional team. And this is one of the most important functions of um, communications professionals today, especially in large organizations. Um, so this, this kind of collaboration really ensures consistent information sharing and messaging, which is so critical to maintaining a consistent reputation um, in the public sphere. Um, he also has helped implement and maintain the company's new SharePoint intranet site. So his role is not only externally facing, but really in creating community and consistent communication internally at Excellus Blue Cross Blue Shield. The one thing that really, uh, one of the things that makes Kevin stand out is that he truly cares about contributing to the greater good. He's very active in his in the profession of public relations and in his local community. He's taught business communications at uh, night class at St. John Fisher College for nine years and is very active with the Public Relations Society of America particularly uh, working tirelessly to promote the value of getting accreditation as an APR, um, which is an accreditation in the practice of public relations and really works toward our entire goal of getting public relations a seat at the management table. Um, Kevin and I had the pleasure of meeting back in 2007 when we both went back to school, to graduate school, at Syracuse University's Newhouse School of Public Communication. And um, we've been in touch ever since. So please welcome Kevin. It's so great to see you and have you here today. That's great to be here. Good. So Kevin, you work for a very large uh, healthcare organization. You're laughing, right? How, how about how many employees are there? There's about 4,200 in our, our uh, nonprofit plan. Uh, but okay. it's it's the largest one of the the largest names in the country. So, if you're across the country, you maybe uh, insured by another Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. We're affiliated, but we're not one company. So we cover 31 counties counties in upstate New York. Have about 1.5 million members, uh, but some of those members live across the country. So it's it's a I wouldn't say it's a daunting task. It's an enjoyable task, but it's also mission driven. So. In, in such a big organization as, as you work in, what is the role of communications? If you could just give us kind of an overview. Sure, sure, definition. Uh, we have uh, staff centers in multiple cities in upstate New York. So we're not one building, one location, like most businesses uh, that, that have other offices. And uh, our job, I'd say, in corporate communications is to be the conscience of the organization, to be the eyes and the ears, uh, for both external and internal, uh, you know, temperature reading. You know, what's the temperature today? How's how's this going to play uh, in our community or amongst our employees? Um, because other operational areas are so focused on what their primary job is, we really need to be Jacks and Jills of all trades, and talking with our communities and knowing what those communities are. Uh, you know, I've I've, I've been. Pri proud to be a jack of all trades. Uh, I don't see it as derogatory, but complimentary, because as a generalist, I know a little about a little bit about a lot of things, and I know who to go to to find out the detail. And I think that's part of our role, um, and that really helps us certainly with the, the pandemic shift to 
hybrid or remote work when most organizations were on site. Um, you know, we've we've survived that. We've done very well. The technology we'll talk about in a couple minutes has helped that. Um, but how we engage with our communities uh, has to continue, even though it's changed how sure. it's done. It needs to continue. So you're a strategist and a, and a you know senior subject matter expert. As you said, you kind of know a little bit about all different parts of the organization, which is so critical. But how does your expertise um, as a convener um, across the organization provide value and, and even save the company money? So it really, yeah, I mean, your it, work affects the bottom yeah. line. I, I think it's, it's the longer you're at an organization, um, you never know everything, but you tend to know more things and hopefully your comprehension of risk management grows so that when you see something, you say something. And that's, you know, in this case, it's, hey, this mailing or this issue might cause this downstream impact because I've seen a trend or something like that before. Or a lot of what we're doing in communications and my work with business resilience is watching for technology changes external. And you know, what, what's going on, whether it's cyber attacks, ransomware, other technology challenges, uh, us connecting this morning through technology, is it going to work or not? Um, our members want to communicate with us in different ways. So it's it, it's our role as convener, convener to say, hey, this is going to be an issue. Let's bring some key folks together. We may not be the subject matter expert on the topic, but we can help coordinate, collaborate the resources so that we have speaking points ready for a situation. Or we can ramp up uh, FAQs on a website because that's what customer care is going to need to answer questions. Um, and the media is going to need that. And all of our other key stakeholders are going to need the answers to questions. So part of it is the crystal ball work. Um, right. And the foresight and, yeah. and judgment. Yeah. yeah. And, and that doesn't happen from day one. Uh, it, you know, hopefully I'll be around here long enough to continue to see a lot of technology changes and, and other business changes. Um, but it's also the strategic why. You know, don't just do a tactic ask why are we doing this what's the business purpose um and a lot of younger practitioners haven't seen it haven't been in the workplace i think back to my first few jobs if you don't do something a few times in a job that is cyclical that happens you know year after year these things happen you, you don't start to see the trends um doesn't mean you're always going to see them but right. you're more likely to see them and prepare um when but you're also, immersed in it, yeah. when you're immersed yeah. in it and happen. Yeah. Or it can take a, a step back and say, here's, here's all the ducks moving around. How do we get them in a row to support our mission, our purpose, our, you know, the question at hand. How, so just elaborate on that a little further and how, how does the communication, how does communications protect the organization and um, how do judgment calls come into play? I mean, that's something that we do on a daily basis, right? Yeah. We help our clients, your your company, my clients, um, make important judgment calls to that will ultimately protect their reputation and image and relationships with their key stakeholders. And maybe you can talk also a little bit about um, your homegrown, you know, external communications review process, because I think that's really fascinating and something that I think would provide a lot of value to people who are watching this broadcast. Yeah, the the second part is first, the, the external communication review, we call it. Um, we built it more than 20 years ago because as a large organization with multiple um, employee centers, multiple uh, opportunities to do large mailings or do large emails, um, quality control became an issue. Um, it was no longer, hey, let's send it down to the print shop and have everyone look at it and do a, a, a manual. Hey, that looked good. Did you call the phone number? Yep. So we built a policy to check our work through communications, legal, um, compliance, a number of other key areas. Um, did, did you call the phone number? Um, but also we built a workflow tool uh, that we're still using. Uh, we're exploring a new technology to move the workflow tool but that allowed us 20 years ago to have a piece of content reviewed and approved by someone who wasn't physically in a building anymore. We were using technology and then putting that content, that large mailing into a database so that if we needed to find it a few months later, 
to prove we did this mailing. Or if a member called and said, hey, I got this letter, we at least have some way to look up and say, okay, I see what you received. Here's what this means. It's context, which any of us as a consumer expect our, our you know, our insurance company, our credit card company, whatever, sure. to know what they just sent us. And years ago, that wasn't easily available. Um, but I've seen many other companies that still don't have a policy to, to check work before it goes wow. um, to create awareness. I mean, you think about, uh, you know, if we do 100,000 piece or 200,000 piece mailing, how many phone calls that might be. And if our customer care folks don't know that a mailing is going out on fill in uh, blank topic. The whole thing has been. Right. Uh, right. So building this process has allowed us to give those key internal stakeholders a heads up and prepare and also contribute oftentimes in the writing or the messaging so that it minimizes potential confusion. Um, that has saved us money. That has certainly managed uh, our reputation because the fewer mistakes that go out, the fewer apology letters have to follow them. Right. Um, whether it's media relations or social media or just 10,000 phone calls of 10,000 members, we're trying to minimize those things because that goes to the quality of what we do, uh, but also the reputation amongst our members and also our employees, most of which are members and live in our communities. So it's kind of that, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats type of process. Talk, talk a little bit about trust because all the things that you're describing here um, are put in place to make, to develop and maintain a very important trust with mm -hmm. your key stakeholders, including yeah. employees. As you said, they are also, uh, they also are members. Um, how does that play into what you do? Yeah, I mean, we, we have worked certainly in, in, in our health plan, um, but in our industry in upstate New York, where mostly nonprofit uh, health insurers, mostly nonprofit hospitals, um, these organizations, we've been here almost 90 years. Uh, I used to work at Rochester General. That's about 175 years old. Wow. Uh, you know, so I mean, you have institutions that are trusted because of their longevity, but also they need to show up every day and maintain that trust. And I think that's that's the challenge with, you know, certainly our industry, because a lot of folks don't think about their insurer until they need to use the card because they have a claim or they have an illness. Right. If you're if you're feeling great, you don't think about it. It's a more it's a transactional uh, type of relationship, and we're okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but we want to make sure that when they do have questions, we're there to advocate. We're there to clarify, um, connect the dots between a member communication and provider communication, and some of the other touch points that they might have questions. And that's a lot of what that ECR process does. It's when a mailing's going out to a provider's office or thousands of providers, our provider communicate or provider relations reps ready to explain that. And is customer care aware that this mailing's going out to the doctor's offices because members, patients will have questions about whatever is being communicated. So it's kind of looping those back, which goes back to trust. Do they trust an answer? Do they trust yeah. the information that they're uh, receiving? Um, you know, I mean, I, I help cover our social media channels and every so often there are posts that people just want to inflame, not inform. Um, and, and that was part of your first, first part of the question. Yeah. Um, when you see something that is, it's not only hurting the trust factor, it's also calling to question the information um, and the credibility have, and the credibility we often have to have a judgment call is do we reply or do we not reply or do we try to take it offline um, if it appears to be a member we clearly try to take it offline we truly truly try to assist but we also don't want the member to add more protected health information into the public view that doesn't support them that doesn't help them um, and oftentimes there's more going on than a simple a tweet or Facebook post can ever answer. Um, so because we don't reply doesn't mean we're not trying to, um, but we're also trying to look at the different areas because again, it goes back to trust. Sure. You know, if, 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 Hey, you're not paying such and such claim, how come you're not, you're not doing this? You're not doing that. I don't, you know, maybe I'm gonna look at another company. Okay. Well, they're doing the same things because we're all following the same guidelines. Right. You know, and, and it's not like you switch, 
you know, car insurance year to year for cost. The health insurance industry is is not only complex, but there's a lot of parity there, you know, and, and, and a lot of us are following the regulations in the states that we're in. So you're not going to get a significantly different outcome someplace else. So that's so really the way that um, you can differentiate your brand value is by really taking those extra steps to make sure that at every touch point that that customer is getting is walking away with a feeling of, wow, like they they're taking care of me. They understand my needs and they're responding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are we are blessed in the fact that we are the the larger health plan in the majority of our service area. That doesn't mean we're the only game in town. Um, we've right, been people here have a, long a choice. Time. Right, and and if they do switch, oftentimes it's because that's their employer's choice. It's not their choice. Right. Um, but the competition is also good quality nonprofit plans. Um, if you look at the quality measures for our service area overall, regardless of which company you're you're insured by, um, there's better clinical outcomes. The the you know, the doctors and, and the hospital systems are, are high quality. So these types of things all play in so that when it comes down to trust, we've been here a while, we continue to be here, we're locally based. Um, those are all factors in, in your brand value. Um, you know, our, our, our new tagline is uh, everybody benefits. Um, and and it's, it's an interesting one because it's not just the member who benefits from quality health care coverage and the quality product and quality service the community because we're in it benefits right. right the providers continue to be providers because they're reimbursed for what they do and they're not doing it as charity yeah. it is their job right. um you know so it's it's striking a balance uh, you know health care that it was always called uh you know health care delivery and health care um is two sides of the same coin so you have to finance it and you have to deliver it it's still the same coin. Sure. And, and, um, but it's, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, area to be in. I mean, I've been in health related jobs since I came out of college. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah. Tell so me it's, a, it's tell me a little bit more about how you create that sustainable collaborative, um, communications infrastructure, because I think that internal relationship building is so critical to what you do. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, part of it, again, it goes back to getting to know people around the organization, um, whether it's, you know, in your operational area or not. I mean, we've, like I said, I, when I came here in 2000, I was used to a health system that was covering a few counties. We had 11,000 employees at that wow. health system. So when I came here and we had maybe half that many employees, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be easy. It's not because you have offices in major media markets across upstate New York with different things going on and different, you know, different weather, <laughs> you know, you could have somebody who has a snowstorm in it and has to close a structure in one area. And the other part of this, the, our service area is sunshine. We've, we've had that, you know, so it's, it's the, um, we're not all in one spot. How do you get to know people sure. um, long before the, you know, the technology where we all put on headsets full time um, and have virtual meetings all day. Um, it's curiosity, you know, a big part of corporate communications and communications overall is storytelling. So how do you find out what are the cool stories um, up and down, in our case, up and down the, the throughway? Um, what are people doing in different service regions right. and what are they doing in their community? So it goes back to that community value. Um, are they baseball coaches, little league coaches? Are they on? Right. Who are the you know, people behind the, the work? Yeah. Who's, who's the skydivers in central New York that, you know, we want to tell a great story about because who jumps out of a perfectly good plane unless they like it, you know, <laughs> Why are they? but we not have me. employees, not me. Right. but we have employees that, you know, have great passions, um, outside of work. They bring that passion to work. And so we try to tell those stories, um, you know, so that not only adds to the credibility, it adds to our localism. Localism and, and talk a little bit about, um, humanizing the organization mm -hmm. and the value of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, uh, I'm sure you've heard it before, but employee picks get more clicks is our totally. internal motto. Um, so as we were going from WordPress five, six years ago, as a, 
it was an okay internal communications platform. We were looking at SharePoint. Uh, this is pre-COVID, but again, you need to have dollars and resources to pivot from one platform to another. Um, but we we're really looking at how do we tell more stories about employees? How do we get uh, more engagement? Um, and by consolidating the platform, building some resources and governance and getting to know who the writers are in the organization, not just the corporate communications writers, but anybody who likes to write a complete sentence, tell a good story, um, can and should be a writer. So we have um, you know, folks up again, up and down the throughway that um, share their stories. They may write their article, draft their article. We may interview them, any combination. But That's as long great. as there's a photo uh, of them doing something, again, maybe the skydiving um, or the food pantry or the Habitat House crew or whatever it is, um, our engagement scores go up because people are seeing people that look like them right. doing things that they wish they were doing. That crowdsourcing of content yeah. is also so, first of all, it builds internal community, right? Because people mm -hmm. want to be a part of it and it builds engagement. Um, but I think that it also, again, it, it's, it's very powerful in humanizing the organization and making customers feel that they're not just dealing with mm -hmm. a brick and mortar, you know, a, right. a glass tower. Right. And we, and we work with our, um, our social media team. So a number of us in CorpCom also, uh, cover social media channels, we take turns. So kind of those of us that used to work in hospitals think about the 24 seven mentality. So we do that as well, uh, but we also take these stories and say, hey, let's let's draft it for external sharing. We get the approval. Uh, it's a story that not only has internal interest, but external interest. Um, and some of those great stories are also uh, employee recruitment. Absolutely. Subtly. Right. Shocking, right. When subtly, people but see again, that you're a people focused organization, they, they're yeah. going to want to be a part of it. It's yeah. definitely and if, an attraction. And if we're them. offering, you know, customer care, entry level jobs like other companies are, what's going to differentiate us? Kevin, finally, my last question for you is how did you manage through COVID in terms of keeping the communication going and presenting the organization as one that was very much in control? We like I said, we were still on WordPress. Um, a number of us on the team just spent probably two months preparing, updating. Those of us that had been through other types of crisis communication yeah. scenarios saw this as similar but different. Um, you know, we had <laughs> Google. We had a cyber attack back in 2015. Many of us responded to that and managed it like most insurance companies seem to have around then. Um, this was different. This was not only health related, it was unknown health, unknown outcome. Um, so we had to really put together um, a communications plan for internal and external, Sure. but mostly looking at the internal because up until I think the day we tested our VPN network remotely, we'd never had more than 20% of our VPN traffic going and that day one when we tested and we had more than 4,000 people on their laptops all remote and it worked and like oh we could do this uh, <laughs> but then we weren't done um, so our, our internal communications plans really ramped up uh, we also externally had to uh, put together COVID uh, microsites with, for, for information for our members and our providers. Um, so we had parallel plans on that going on. Internally, we built uh, an internal COVID uh, page or section of our WordPress site because all of a sudden we had all employees coming to this platform that they kind of occasionally had engaged with. This was now their pipeline for information. So we were doing more videos than ever before. That's great. Uh, we were doing more um, written messages. We were trying not to just email everything separately. We were trying to consolidate information into a searchable platform. So if they didn't see the answer right away, they could still find it because it was valid and sure. accurate and maintained. Um, and our numbers continue as we late that year, late 2020, we pivoted to SharePoint for the homepage. 
Um, but we still had about two years of work after that because we had dozens of old uh, intranet sites that were very siloed and not cert they, they didn't they weren't on the same platform mm -hmm. so even right. if it was wordpress the sites didn't search across each other so we had about two years of cleanup again working with people who we never physically met with to assess whether the data that they had on their sites was sustainable uh, had a business purpose um you know uh, we apply we wrote and applied governance We've set up training channels on how to communicate internally and then build an internal network of those writers I was talking about uh, so that most operational divisions have at least one or two people that are the point people for their their groups, their information sections, but it's all on a common platform now. So we can teach all the editors at the same time about something that Microsoft might be rolling out on SharePoint. That's great. And we can also see best practices because some sites might be trying to do a little more with how their page looks than another. And even though we have general standards, we're still testing those because we're always learning. So it's kind of this uh, internal learning community as well. Well, I think, I think one of the roles of communications is to continually learn, right. Yeah. And, and uh, expand on what we know and certainly I think all of us uh, around the world learned a ton during COVID. We were forced mm -hmm. forced to. It was a whole different level of crisis. Um, anyway, I can't believe we're at time, but oh uh, this was a great <laughs> conversation, Kevin. I knew it would be. I know. And, um, I know it would. I'm just so glad you were here. And thank you for sharing your great expertise. And um, uh, check out Kevin at, at, on LinkedIn. Connect with him. And um, I hope you'll come back again sometime. Glad to. Glad okay. to. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks a lot.